Welcome to Hindsight Hacking. I'm Corey Carter. And I'm Ron Cool, and you are listening to Hindsight Hacking, where we have talked to hundreds of entrepreneurs hacking their hindsight to give you clearer foresight. And now, as we still bring you these same great, amazing interviews each and every week, we are adding bits and pieces to serve you in such a great way. These bits and pieces are some mindset hacks, visibility hacks, traffic hacks, and more on the daily hacks. So we want to make sure that you have all the tools and all the resources that you need to gain more visibility and gain more traffic. And obviously, to get more sales. So head over to GetHHM.com forward slash toolbox to grab your free resources to get the help you need to get more. And if you're interested, after you collect all those freebies, because they're amazing, hit the link in the show notes and jump on our calendar because we definitely want to help you. Guys, we absolutely love the community that we've created with your guys' help, and we love all the hindsight hackers. So jump on in and get on our calendar. So... Without further ado, what do you say? Let's get to it. All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Hindsight Hacking. And today we are joined by another another Denver resident, Mr. TJ Slattery. So for anybody that doesn't know, TJ co-founded Zunai Street Brewing Company in Denver, Colorado, and operated as the business manager plan, fund, build, and launched the brewery in Denver Highlands starting of 20, the summer of 2015. Now, fast forward a few years, and in February of 2020, TJ pivoted and became an advisor at Cultivate Advisors, which I know we're going to get into deep today. Uh, and he works with small business owners and entrepreneurs to grow and scale their businesses. TJ, I am super stoked to get into this today. Welcome to the show. Guys, thanks so much for the lovely introduction. Great to be here today. Happy Tuesday. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, we're excited. And uh, I'm not sure where my beer is. I feel I should have a beer. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I feel I should have right now. But never never too early. It is never too early. It's, it's what, 2.30. So if you put an orange wet in it, it counts as breakfast and you're going to go. That's what I thought. That's how I usually wake up. But anyway, before we get too far into it, TJ, why don't you uh, take a moment to give a little bit more of a backstory about who you are? Great. Uh, so I've always been in the um, an entrepreneurial line of work. Uh, before I was with the brewery, um, I spent a lot of time in small business management and entrepreneurship. Spent some time in London working with the facilities management group there and their hospitals. Uh, and then came back and started a partnership uh, with a friend of mine who was the brewer for Zuni Street. Uh, and I did the business side of the operation. Uh, and he was looking for somebody to partner with to because he wanted to do the beer side of it and he needed somebody to run the shit. So I was like, great, let's uh, let's put together. So my my side of it was putting together all the systems and processes in a brewery startup and finding um, uh, the finances to get it started, finding a location, you know, getting the build out, managing the time on that, uh, doing the the build out uh, budget, and then all of a sudden, you know, things flip and now you're not. A startup, um, you know, trying to get to through your runway. Now you're operating. So then it was working with employees and building a brand and getting a community, uh, and it was an incredible experience. We operated from for three years, 2017 to 2020, uh, before exiting uh, in February, just before the shutdown, and really took away some amazing experiences. I'm working in with the startup in a brewery in a very competitive market. Like how do we stay relevant in Denver with 85 other breweries in town? So marketing was really key. Building a community was you know, essential, but having great staff. And so I've worked on all these different propellers uh, in a startup for recruitment and leadership and marketing. And um, uh, let's see, all of our, I did all our in-house finances. And it was amazing to have that uh, and simultaneously work on my MBA at DU finish both those at the same time and then pivot and say, well, what to do with this toolbox, this experience of uh, doing this from the ground up and going through all the aches and pains of a startup, find a way to be in the black, get the MBA, and then what's this good for now? And so pivoting and saying, well, this is perfect for other small businesses. And I found when I was making that pivot, the more I talk with entrepreneurs, small business owners, the more excited I got. I go into meetings for like, all right, let's talk like half an hour about operations. I'm either four hours later, whiteboarding things out. I'm like, what about this? And what'd you do over there? And what are we gonna do about this? And like, you're supposed to be here for half an hour. I'm like, I know, I got excited. 
<laughs> so I found that my passion was really with helping small businesses to uh, scale and grow and using my experience and academic education uh, to help support them. That's how I came in to work with, uh, to cultivate on that. Love that. love that. And so many, so many business owners, you know, you, they start something and, and they don't realize all the different pieces of it. They, they, or they buy into a franchise expecting everything to just be handed to them. And, uh, and so I kind of, I kind of love how, it, you know, in your, in your opening statement, right. It's, manage from to plan fund build launch like those are all four very different pieces and i truly don't believe that a ton of new entrepreneurs new business owners understand that that it, it, it these are four very distinct different steps that one must be ready for must act on and must uh plan for in each every bit of that so walk us through that a little bit before we get into the the cultivated advisors, because uh, again, anybody that has success and you guys had the success at Zunai Street Brewing, anybody that has success, like those four elements are so crucial. Yeah, um, it, was, it just took a lot of mindfulness and looking down the road and realizing like what, you know, put a timeline together. What are we trying to get out of this? And so, all right, the goal is, Let's you know get open within the next eighteen months to two years. Okay, let's work back from there. What's it going to take? Like, well, it's going to take at least a year for a build out, and or you know around a year. And then and now you got to figure out your tanks. Tanks are going to up to you know eight or twelve months to get those in and installed. Um, and you got to find a location. So it kind of working back to say, all right, we've got a really good plan on our timing and what's going to take you know cost to open open this. So being really meticulous on the planning side. So working back, and I, I still kept this, I'm sure with a couple of friends, um, putting together a budget for a startup. What are our tanks going to cost? What do we need for working capital? What do we need? You know, How much is it going to cost to build this out? Work with like five builders to see what can we expect this to cost to make this all happen. Um, and then put that into your general plan, right? So that's kind of the, the end goal is finished there. But then from the beginning, we say, all right, we have this business plan to build a brewery that does X amount of capacity and that helps you on the beginning side to say, all right, what space do we need? What should it cost us per month to work to be there? You know, what part of town is the busiest? Where can we get the most attraction? So we're working on angle, but also coming it coming at it from the beginning, saying, is what we want out of the brewery? Where's it going to be? So once we had the, the end goal, we start looking at different locations, right? This is all in the the planning stage and saying, um, look at locations, have the business plan ready because you're. The hardest part, I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs about this, especially if they're doing a brick and mortar build out, is a chicken and egg. To get investors, they want to know where your building is going to be. Where are you going to do all this from? To tell them about that, you need to have premises. But in order to get premises and for a landlord or you know to rent to you or to get you know to buy a building, you need money. Uh -huh. So <laughs> it was this juggle. It took us eight months to find a location at 29th and Zuni in, uh, in the Highlands. And it was talking to all different people and just trying to figure out that puzzle piece so you could have rubber hit the road. And then once it did, be ready. All right, we've been working with an architect for eight months. So what's it going to look like when we do this place? Okay, if these are the basic plans, what's it going to cost? And so it's funneling all these pieces together at the same time. Of Here's our general plan. Meet with investors, meet with the landlord, but also trying to budget your time so you're not running out of money in the build out. Uh, and then just put this runway together that's like this rev up over you know a year and a half till you're finally opening day. Um, it's sorry I don't have a, like a more clear explanation of how that process works because it is you're doing all those pieces at once, right? You're building the plan while you're selling to investors what it's going to look like at the end, and you're trying to sell investors how great this is going to be without having a location. And so there is a lot of salesmanship going on, on getting buy-in from a landlord or from a, a bank. Um, but there's also a lot of um, the specific planning and like, how is this going to look and having the creativity and imagination in a, in a location like that to put that together while you're selling it. And then with my partner having the expertise on, okay, what are we going to brew there when it's done? It was just constant moving parts, especially once we got open. I think one of the biggest things I identify with entrepreneurs and respect most about them is that I see it as like, it's like running down a hill with a wheel going a hundred miles an hour while you're trying to put plates on. Like, that's it. You're, you're juggling 12 plates in a row, but you're like, 
running with this shit as it goes. And when, as soon as I mentioned that to entrepreneurs, like, that's it. You get it. I'm like, I know. I know. I've been there. It's You're going through a lot right now. I, I feel you. But it's um, it's an amazing process to do all that. And it's 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 incredible once it all comes to fruition. Wow, you're giving me PTSD back to my old days. <laughs> like seriously, yeah. I am, there's there's been I, I've opened up hundreds of restaurants nationwide, and you know I I would always go in because the owners would always think it's going to open up sooner than construction think it's going to open, and it's like here's the timetable. I always give you like a week or two after the timetable for construction and everything because. I also know it's not going to hit on time, <laughs> right? So you, you have to build in some flexibility. And, uh, and that like instantly I was like traumatized uh, when you were talking. I was like, oh my gosh, I've been there. I'm very scared. Oh, I don't want to go back to that. <laughs> your, your time flexibility. And we had, we had a great contractor, but the other big one that can hit you is those change orders. You know, oh they might God, give you a this really, yeah, they might just give you this amazing quote like, oh, perfect. And then you're six months in, like actually it's going to cost you another 85 grand to do this. Well, you sure? I would, I would be the person they would send in when it's like a week out and there's zero chance it's going to open. Okay. Ah. And and so I would go in and I think Corey knows this story. Like I, I went into this, uh, this one restaurant and literally they had, they had nothing ready to go and the health inspector wouldn't, you know, check you off until like you were ready to open. Yeah. Right. And I go, we're opening Friday and this is Monday. And he goes, there's no way I go, there is a way. And you're going to come back. <laughs> you're going to come back on Thursday and approve me and we'll be done. And oh my gosh, like we got it open, but it was crazy long hours because if you wait to the last minute to send in, I was known as the fireman. If you <laughs> send in the fireman or the person at the end to just like get it together as quick as possible, like it's stressful. It's stressful for everyone involved, like just plan it appropriately. So I love that you, you work yourself back and then, yeah, you got to budget in some time. Um, oh my gosh. The health department, I think what, as a, as a business person, you know, entrepreneur, someone who's getting into beer, uh, dealing with the city, to get planning, Denver, city of Denver, especially to get planning. Until you mentioned the health department, I think I blacked out parts of that experience in my mind. That was the most painful. We're like, we have to get the like. No, there's a a little. There was a, there wasn't a cap on that one electrical panel, and we're gonna have oh, to yeah. come back in two weeks. You're like, like hyperventilating yeah. for some little thing on the inspection. Oh, to oh I remember pulling was in- him aside, and I go, look, man, because he said the the only way we're gonna come in. Or he goes, I won't be back for a month, is what he told me. And this was on Tuesday. And and I go, You're coming back Thursday. And he goes, you, You're not co-. he goes, I, I don't have time on Thursday. I go, You really need to come back. I, and I remember talking to him for like three hours. And the contractor said, dude, there's zero chance he's coming back on Thursday. I go, I swear if you don't have your stuff done by Thursday. <laughs> There'll be someone else in here on Thursday, but but you're going to be done and everything will be set up. And then uh, I told the guy, this is what I told the health inspector. I go, I'm pretty sure you should come back on Thursday because what I think is happening since I'm not completely involved is I think they're doing training on Thursday. And I know we can't train in the building until I probably shouldn't say this on the air, really. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm gonna, and, and, you know, until we get you know, checked off by the health department. He goes, Oh, if I come on Thursday and they're in here, they're going to get fined. I go, well, I'm just, I'm just letting you know. Nice. So, so he's so, looking his chops. Yeah. He goes, he goes, what time's the training? I go, the training's at nine 30, man. He goes, oh, I'm going to be here. I said, okay. So he shows up, he shows up at nine 30. Where's the training? I go, it's actually across the street. I stopped them because I didn't want to get fined. But since you're here, why don't you check it out? And he he signed off and we got it open. I was going to ask how you got him to come back. That's brilliant. Yeah. He, yeah. he only came back because he thought he was going to screw you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was great. Oh and it wasn't God, you because I was just from corporate and it was helping somebody else. It was it was awesome. I loved it. Anyway. Anyway. Mm. All right. So you opened up a brewery. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think like every guy on the planet either wants one of two things, a brewery 
or a sports bar. Like everyone wants to open one of those. I wanted to open one. I still want to open one. Like yeah, I was just saying, like, like wanted. I, I mean, I would do a sports bar all day long. So. Yeah, exactly. I I was telling my wife, I go, if we have this sports bar, I can just go to work at the sports bar. And she said no, but I tried. I tried going. The yeah, answer was no. <laughs> but anyway, so. I think everyone sees the glamour and, you know, Corey and I both being in franchising, you know, you get those people that they think you, you put up a sign and instantly business will come because it's a restaurant. People need to eat and it's really easy money. One, it's not. No, it, it is not. What did you have one of those moments that after you opened it, like one, you're super excited. You're excited. That's grand opening. People came. Did it stay busy? Did you have the natural drop off? How did that go? Yeah, you know, we were we were really successful from from opening, yeah. and at least what we wanted to get in the door. I remember the first couple. Of months, I think any brewery, the first two or three months, you're just you know roofs off. Um, but then there's usually a, it's a curve. You're like you're the new brewery in town, everybody wants to try, it. and then inevitably you're going to come back to like your regular stuff, and then have to kind of go from there. And we we did experience a bit of that by like month four or five, and then it, you know it was a pivot. It's like all right, well how how do we become and stay relevant in the mind's eye of the Denver public for the remainder of this? Right. And, you know, a big, a big point of contention that I always had with my partner was, well, what are we, what are we selling here? And um, again, as a salesperson, I'd, I'd piss them off all the time because it, it, for me at the end of the day, you know, as a business guy, we're selling widgets, it's product. And I made the mistake of telling my partner one time, like, like something about product and he freaked out because it's, it's beer. It's, it's Jesus blood, right? It's important. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. And, um, but to me, it's like, well, we can't, we can't go to Denver and say, we've got the best beer in town. One, everybody can say that. And two, you know, it's customers can be fickle. And it's like, what have you done for us lately? And you can have new releases and bring people and everything else. But we spent so much time, all that time we we're building out. I'm going to explore other breweries, like 18 months. I went to every brewery in town. What do you like? What don't you like? Why are they busy? When are they busy? What, you know, the, what's the sound? What's the lighting? What are the, you know, the bartenders like? And really it's like, well, we need to create an environment for like a specific group and like find a way to target this. So it was actually a class I had taken earlier uh, at, for my MBA at DU is co-creating the customer experience. And it's like, let's talk about everything in the place except for the product, i.e. the beer. And what's make this about the experience when you come in, like, yeah, you're going to have a beer, obviously. That's what we're all about. But let's talk about, and there's a, there's a, um, a psychological value. And the, some of the best advertisers do this, like Apple does this. You come in and you're thinking about everything except the money you're about to spend on this new phone. You're thinking about the full experience. So what I started doing for the place was developing programs that had something for everybody. So by the time I left, I was doing music five, six nights a week. Like for 2020, it was except for I think Monday, we had live music or entertainment every night of the week. We had trivia on Tuesdays. We had a mug club with 150 plus people. We had a run club that was doing upwards of 50 people. Um, we had like one big blowout party once a month, Joe, you know, all these different themes. It was like, well, let's find something we did. We had dog adoptions. We had a huge pride month. We had, um, you know, every holiday you could think of, we would like push it out for that month. And so it's like, let's make this a place that people just know something's happening. Like at first it was, oh, can we get, can we get food trucks every day of the week? And then after six months, like you cannot not have a food truck. People expect there to be a food truck and something else going on. And so it did make my job harder, but it just became this hub of like, well, we need something to do. Let's go to Zuni because it's going to have something going on and it's going to be welcoming and it's going to have the right music and temperature and like everything that when I go in there, oh, fuck yeah, I feel great. Right. And yeah, I'm going to have a beer and I'm probably going to have many. But that's not that that, that couldn't be focus. that's not your competitive advantage. And and my ex partner had gone really done well. He won a couple of awards at JBF, like fantastic. That's going to be a hook for people that really care about you know the, the ribbons. But what keeps people every day all the time is like what makes this special to them? Like this is the spot I met my fiance. This is the spot where my buddies go and hang out. We can all meet here. This is spot I can bring my dog. This is you know. It's it's making it something for everybody and just keeping it like always something going on, which was exhausting, but like, you know, is a, a huge vehicle for creativity. So cool, and definitely you 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 bring up Apple and and you kind of based off of that, like it is 
so much more than just that widget. It's so much more than just that beer. Uh, you might get what 5%, 2% of the people that come for that ribbon that come for that beer specifically every time. But then, yeah, everybody else is coming for that community and that place that you've developed. So, so cool. So, so now transition to what you do as an advisor, how, how does, how did this experience uh, assist you as now you're out there helping small business owners wear those hats of marketing or wear the hats of operations or, or doing the sales or doing, uh, you know, all the different things that they must do, like kind of walk us through, like how did that transition and everything that you learned opening the brewery to now you're helping, you know, those other business owners. Uh, so one of the main things that attracted me to um, being a business advisor for small businesses and working with Cultivate specifically is that I just, I love entrepreneurs. The, the lifestyle, the mindset, the ability to start and run or operate or grow a business, I think is one of the um, maybe most undervalued, but like for me, the most appreciated in my mind, or should be the most appreciated skill set that there is because it takes someone being freaking crazy to do what we do to get that loan and put your house on the line to like, you know, have major conflict at home because you're working and we're going to work a holic and this is your new baby. But these are the people that are innovating and starting new businesses and being creative and they're job creators and they're taking care of their employees. And like, if you're a good owner, you're building culture that they look after for you look after each other. They're being paid well, they're respected employees. Like this is the, the hardest thing you can do. And I think there's jobs where you can go and maybe be a investment banker and like, it's more life draining and soul sucking. I don't know if it's as hard to what those guys are doing because you're managing eight departments. It's the most fascinating career that you can have. So as an advisor, I work with people in every different kind of industry. I get to work with people that have a company in blockchain. Uh, one of my clients is a restaurant, uh, I have a client in, in um, you know, security and fire alarm installations. So it's all over the place, but it's these are the people I like to talk with the most in that I can help them with their problems. So I like to come out and the way, the way things are set up, I'll meet with clients, you know, twice a month, you know, a couple hour sessions and we'll roll through and put a roadmap together to help get them to the next level. A lot of entrepreneurs kind of get stuck. You'll get to a certain level of your planning, of your capabilities of, you know, imaginative, like I want to keep going. So I love having people like get to that next part. Like, all right, like you want to grow, but your sales are solved. Let's dig into your sales. Who are your clients? How often you get in touch with them? What's your BD process? Say, like, okay, you're selling like crazy, but now you can't keep up with demand. Well, let's work on who you're recruiting. How are you going to find these people? How are you training them? How you, and then once you have a team, what is your leadership style? So I love digging in and just helping entrepreneurs to make their problems better problems. Like they're always going to have problems, but the trick is make them like improve those as you go. So I like having the pivot because I want to continue working with entrepreneurs and I, I'll, I'll be an owner again at some point, either I'll start something or buy something again. But um, in the meantime, I'm just loving working with this wide variety of um, owners and operators and entrepreneurs and helping them on their day to day. And just like, how can we continue to make you better um, as I, as I improve as a professional individual myself. And you gave me PTSD again over the last like couple months of my life. Like, <laughs> That's exactly, that was Corey and I's actual structure of what was just happening to us over the last couple months, for sure. Yep. Um, you know, because again, you get somewhere by the skills or talents you have. And then when you get to that point, you have to find a new way of doing things to get to the next level. And then you have to find a new way of doing things to get to the next level. You have to bring other people in that are the right people that fit your culture and all of that stuff in order to keep growing. Right. So, yeah, holy smokes. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of it's kind of eerie on the head, but a lot of those problems uh, they transcend. That's why you know I'm I'm industry agnostic. I probably wouldn't work with a banker. I don't I don't know how that would work out. <laughs> but there, there's a few firms that it's not really my wheelhouse. But generally industry agnostic because at the end of the day, one it's widgets, two it's the same problems but with a different service, different product, maybe different industry. But it's the same skill sets that as a business owner or a business minded person. I'm, I'm a great Ying and I love finding industry experts like my ex partner who's a brewer, who's a Yang. And we've worked really well together. Like you make some awesome beer, make a ton of it and do it all the time and I'll make it profitable. And we're just going to have this Ying Yang. And that's why I like to find partners now who have that industry expertise. They can be in any spot, but they want somebody to kind of help them with 
the the basics in the business so they can keep afloat and work on those that balancing those two um, growth versus scale. Ah, so good. All right. So in in that journey, uh, you, you talk about the two times a month. Like, how do you prepare? How are you preparing these clients? Like Ron and I, I mean, we have different things and we, we help people launch their podcasts. We edit their podcasts, right? And so we prepare them in a sense of what they need to do to launch and then what they need to do to stay consistent and maintain and grow. Uh, and so with such a variation of, of business types, I'm sure every single one, there's a little bit different that, steps that you need to take to get them prepared to make the most out of those two sessions a month. So yeah, what's that kind of process for you with the, such a various uh, of ownership? So we, we spend a lot of time with Cultivate um, working with clients at the onset. So we, we start off with a, a two hour free advising session. And this is, um, you know, pre pre agreement. It's just, let's see if we're going to work out. Um, tell a lot more about Cultivate, about myself. And then we do this deep dive on uh, a business owner's business. And we go through what we call our six propellers. So there's financials, sales, marketing, recruitment, leadership, productivity. And we go through and see what are your biggest pain points? And then we dive in a bit deeper and say, okay, like obviously productivity is a problem for you. You're chasing a ton of shiny red balls. You're not getting anything done. And we have other pieces under that deep dive that we can say, let's pull these out. What's the first thing we should be working on? And so by the time we're done with that session, we've got a roadmap of at least the next six, three to six months of things that we can be working on and dialing on. Like what's hurting you most? And it's really just asking a ton of questions and listening and probing on what's bottom of the business. And then once that, you know, once they bounce out, maybe on scale, it's, all right, in six months, shoot, we do need to look at your website. But right now your biggest thing is, you know, managing your employees and having uh, accountability you know, sessions. So it's, it's really taking that free session to deep dive, ask million questions and see what's hurting them. So we can start, you know, with those at first, um, we slow at the first meeting as well. We slow things down a lot. We call it our partnering meeting. So we, we really kind of set the road, um, set the tone for how we'll be operating together. We don't work as vendors or suppliers. We work as like non-equity partners, um, an unbiased third party to come in and work with you as like a co-pilot. So we're kind of setting the tone there. We do it, you know, really hard in on that roadmap to make sure we have we're aligned on what those goals are and we're trying to go. And after slowing it down, like really nitpicking through everything on the business, it's like, all right, now we know we can prioritize and let's start knocking this out. And so just working out from that early planning session, like we talked about before with this partnership too. early planning, slow it down, get all this figured out. And then rubber hits the road and we're like, accelerate our clients growth is like to a ridiculous degree. I love that you said expectations. I think a lot of people when they get clients, especially in, you know, the entrepreneurial space, I think they skip that step. Right. So there's been a couple of people that we've had to set expectations where they've never done a funnel or ads. And they're like, I'm going to create this. It's my first funnel and I'm going to make a million dollars. And we're like, and you're not. So let's talk about why not. Right. <laughs> like, let's set some expectations. How about we start with none? <laughs> right. You're going to make zero dollars. And if you're cool with that, then if you make a dollar, you're happy. But, uh, you know, I think that's the biggest piece where setting those expectations, people just gloss over that because they're just excited they have a client. Right. And then in the long term, that sets up issues for you on a bigger scale because you're never going to meet their expectation if a you don't know what it is or you haven't helped create it yep right yeah um, big big time attrition issue yeah we have found the the one of the uh, biggest ways that we ensure staying power with those relationships and partnerships is our partnering meeting and they want to get going as fast as they can like we know we're going to get there just bear with me this is so important let's really get to the bottom of it really align and once we get that taken care of we can go but bonanza but we got to figure this out first so yeah, good, very good point. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit, and you know, hindsight hacking. Our goal is we gotta we gotta hack your hindsight to give our audience and our listeners clearer foresight. So, uh, with that in mind, if you could go back, TJ, I don't know if it's your first class that's led you down entrepreneurship, or it's the the launch phase of opening the brewery, or 
before that, uh, what's what's kind of that number one thing that you wish you knew uh, as you started down this entrepreneurial journey? Um, I wish I knew how to be a better communicator with my business partner. Um, I learned that from my personal life partner, um, and then in hindsight, looking at how it was with my partner. We were friends for 20 years going into this, and we don't really talk anymore, <laughs> which is, yeah, it's really it's really sad. I, um, everyone's got the reasons don't go into business with friends, but we, we had our own specific ones. But I think one of the big ones was we kind of assumed that we had a lot of things figured out just between us. And whether it was for that or just from us not being great communicators, there's a lot of things that came up that we weren't aligned with, that we didn't have the same vision, didn't have the same goals or values. And we were just bumping heads all the time. And I didn't know how to slow things down at the time and say, hey, we need to stop right now. We need to sit down. I need to hear what's what the hell's the matter and like get to the bottom of it. And like, is this something that we can fix? How, do, how can we be more communicated? So I stopped pissing you off so much. And like really dive in and, and not wanting to beat around the bush and just say what really is the problem and try to set, um, I think ahead of time, set things that we agree to on. We're going to communicate no matter what, every week we're sitting down for an hour meeting. I don't care what it's about. Um, make it happen. Make the things on the table. Just start putting, I think in hindsight, put things in line. Like we can't let this part of our relationship go because if that goes, what else could happen? So I think putting some more parameters around that relationship and just being knowing how to be uh, a better, less avoided communicator would have would have helped a lot. Yeah, because business partners is like another marriage. Yeah, you're married again. I did not say I do, Ron. You I'm did, sorry. you did, and I, I have papers. There's no ring. The uh, ring? Uh, no, that's a, that's a huge point too. Um, just with communication, obviously for anything we do, but but for I assume with as an advisor, TJ, you're working with ownership, you know, whether they're solopreneurs or, or not, like the communication has got to be a part of your system as they talk with vendors, as they talk with employees, as they talk with customers, however it looks, right? Like the, the whole, whole shebang, it's got to be involved in that. Like I, I'm, I know Ron and I, that's huge for us. We meet every week for sure. Uh, and we spend way too much time on Zoom anyway, daily, but we have a team meeting, a daily huddle with um, you know, half of our team, eight thirty every morning for 15, 20 minutes. And, and, uh, cause that communication that is such a, such a great point. Yep. And it's, you know, it's no, we practice what we preach at, at cultivate, you know, I've got a, a weekly meeting with, uh, my cohort leader. We talk almost every day about clients and best practices. We have like a, a Western division huddle that we have a similar thing. And, you know, a, a weekly, you know, company meeting, it's, it's great how much those lines of communication are open. And there's something, if somebody falls to the cracks or something's up, it's just a constant stream of communication. And also we, we coach on conflict management. We coach on assertive behavior. And so we're able to practice what we preach, you know, week in, week out on if someone's not meeting goals or somebody's doing this or that, you know, the things that we're teach, coaching our clients on, we're using internally to grow as a company. That's great. I love that you teach conflict management because I think a lot of people don't don't teach that and they don't know how to fight correctly I like to say because people usually fight to win instead of resolve right or find find a find a coexistence piece instead of just I want to win the fight right it's huge everybody yeah. wants to, especially with business guys everybody yeah. wants to win and there's that's again that this assertive behavior is is more like a, a negotiative approach mm -hmm. most people come at come out of situation where we're either very passive or we're aggressive. And that's like, naturally you're one or the other. It's so rare you get somebody who's naturally assertive, which is a combination where it's like, I need to get my objectives done, but I understand you have your own. Let's find a way we can make this happen together. And that's just a sort of approach versus out of my way, we're gonna do it this way, follow me or else. Versus, yeah, you know, we can do it your way. That's that's fine, I'll, I'll get what I need some else, right? That's aggressive and passive. And it it's means so much to teach people a sort of behavior where we it's a constant like let's do this together. Yeah, definitely. All right. So so with your your twice a month, uh, you you usually it looks like you, you at cultivate you guys have a six month kind of first engagement that people sign on for, right? Yep. So what's what's kind of that whole goal? Like obviously every restaurant every uh, ownership is going to have probably different goals, but what's as a 
when do you know you've succeeded across that six months? When do you really have the results that you're trying to drive for these clients of yours? Uh, how do you know it's a win? You know, for what we try to pull out a lot in that partner meeting and in, in the free advising session is we talked a lot about your vision and your goals, short term, long term. Um, I got off the phone with the prospect this morning, uh, who I think would be a great client. Uh, he's a handyman up in the mountains. And he's like, short term, I just need a second van, but I need to get the financing to get a second van, but I need to be able to, I don't know, it's all these little paths, but like to get that second van would mean everything or to get premises. So I'm like, well, short term, yeah, let's knock that out. We can get the second van. I can help you, help you to get there. But long term, all right, maybe I want to get to 5 million like exit value. Let's get to that. But there's a lot of short term things we can find. We, we need to get you an assistant. We need to get you X, Y, and Z. So early on, it's like the things that people are, they're like just out of reach. They can't quite figure it out. It's all those short term goals that we can write down early on to make those attainable in the first three to six months. Um, I had the one with the restaurant owner that I work with, and he's, he's like, I got out of the restaurant. Like, I'm working on the restaurant. One of the first goals, like, I need to get so I can work on the business instead of just in it. And we yeah. hit, like, after, you know, two months, it's like, I did it. I got the people in place. I trust what they're doing. I can, like, get out and actually work on the business instead of just being in the kitchen all the time. Like, we did it. We did it. And it was just, you know, write these goals down and then make sure that you acknowledge them when you, when you surpass them. Mm, I love that because you are acknowledging or, or taking your wins, right? So you got to have a win in place. So that's good. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. So that goes back to the whole restaurant thing. So many owners don't understand that you have to be in the business for just a hot minute until you get it going. Um, at least that's what I've seen, especially if you only have one restaurant. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, so when when you're putting things together, and, and you have a client and maybe they've, do you only work with startups or do you help people that are in business for a while to help organize their business structure a little bit? Or do you really like the beginning phases? Um, typically clients have been around for a year or two plus okay. because they've, it's funny and I, you'll, you'll, you'll see the same thing. Uh, so many entrepreneurs are in the startup phase. It's at the Mike Tyson uh, quote. Like everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Right. And so it's, it's really hard to approach. And I was the same way. I think if somebody approached me as a startup, I'm like, forget you. I know what I'm doing. I got this whole plan. Like all those things are going to put together. Like I'm working like crazy on this. I got this. And it's not until you get a year or two and you're like, oh my God, I could use some help. Or wow, I did everything I wanted to do, but I don't know what's next. What can I get to? Where's the next level? Um, or I could, I could leverage some outside knowledge to achieve the goals that I know I want to get to. Um, so usually that like one or two years, you know, they're operating, they're bringing cash in. So they're, you know, if you're really strapped or you're a startup, it's hard to, um, to justify wanting to pay for pay for help. So we try to find groups. that's a better fit when they're not really strapped because then they can, you know, pay for the partnership month in month out. Um, but yeah, they've been offering a couple of years. It helps them have a few employees because then that also puts on the, you know, the leadership and recruitment lever where, all right, I've got these people now, what do I do? Um, and they're already on the stages of growing and scaling. You know, the biggest thing is finding people that, that have the open, open mindset. They want to change their business. They really want to grow it, but don't know how and are eager to listen. They can be, um, put the hubris, the entrepreneurial hubris aside for a minute and be like, I think I could actually learn something. And so it's hard finding that that mindset and it takes sometimes it takes a little bit of experience with their business before they can get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. And Ron and I, you know, in the online space, if any time we're we're talking to somebody like if you are a coach, you should probably have a coach. Right. Like you if you're in the field of trying to help develop someone else in some fashion, like you should probably be developing yourself in that same fashion. And so, but, but it starts with that mindset. It starts with that open mind to uh, be willing to take that feedback and, and stuff from someone else. And uh, I know I personally won't work with anybody that's not have that doesn't have that, right. If they don't have a coach, you probably will never be my coach. If you aren't out there, like really trying to better yourself that, and you have to have an open mindset to do that, then you are not the right person for, for me, for sure. I'm pretty sure Ron's on the same page. So, uh, but all right. So 
last question for me regarding uh, the your whole process with Cultivate as an advisor. You've got, again, you helping people through the vision and the planning uh, early on. You're meeting with them twice a week. Uh, you're working on operations and productivity and, and the financial aspect, which I guess we could have a, probably a full 30 minute episode on, on just that. Um, but what's your favorite part about it? Like, what's the, what's the one thing when you get to a certain point with, uh, with an owner or an entrepreneur, when you get to a certain point of like, Oh yeah, today we're teaching this today, we're going to deep dive in this part. <laughs> like what is, what is that one thing for you that you just truly love uh, when you, when you're working with them? It's it's different for everybody, but it's it's when you can find that aha moment, and I mean for for one or or knowing that you have a skill set that somebody is it's like unfathomable for them to understand it. Like the one uh, friend that's a client was like, I would love to be able to read my P and L and understand it, and I'm like, yes, let's talk about it. And this is the you know for me it's it's bread and butter, but for you it's going to be crazy information that you're going to be able to digest and know your business so much better. Um, uh, a couple other clients will like, you'll find something on their PL that's going to like, what are you paying for that for? Take that off. Or you're working with that guy. Let me put you with this other person, save you $2,000 a month. You can pay for my service instead, but going right. and helping them with aha moments or just little hacks that can help their business. And there's so many things that I think for a lot of us just kind of are, it seems like bread and butter. Uh, but for someone that is running their business, but their background is more an industry expert for something else that you can bring to them that changes their world and brings so much value. And for you, you're like, great. So this is for me, this is, you know, I live and breathe this stuff for you. This is going to, you know, get you over the the six figure mark for your take home. Like, let's dig into it. So I think it's those aha moments of, to me, stuff that's like simple for them, like earth shattering. And when you see that, like, that moment, you're like, yes, we did it. We did it. All right, now let's go implement it and save you some money and get you some sleep. Love it. Love it. I know there's people uh, listening that are like, I need TJ. Like, that they, you need a shirt that says, I need TJ. Because I know there's people <laughs> are like, oh my gosh, I want to connect with him. I need to like get his services today. Where can they find you, TJ? Great. Uh, let's see. I think you guys have my uh, information for LinkedIn. If it's it's on there, but you can uh, find me on LinkedIn or drop me an email. It's tj at cultivateadvisors.com. Uh, also, shoot shoot me a text. Give me a call 303-515-0942. Uh, and through uh, your guys' podcast, I'd love to put out uh, a few free advising sessions. So depending mm -hmm. on people writing in. Uh, happy to do you know three through the podcast uh, to those those two hour deep dives on um, some of your listeners' businesses, so we can take a look and see if there's any way that we can help them. And if those don't work out um, through that time, they still get their whole roadmap and any modeling that we do, and that's uh, the value they get from putting their time in with me. Nice, perfect. All right, so if, <laughs> if it pays to listen uh, and, or watch the show here, so that's right. uh, for anybody that. If they want to join you uh, for or take you up on that free session, they just need to email you or connect with you on LinkedIn and say they heard you on Hindsight Hacking uh, and they want to get that roadmap going. Is that, is that right? That's right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what to post. It makes it easier to um, put it on, on the site or I'll do um, a post later as well. But just with contact information, let me know that they found, found me on your guys' cast and uh, we'll go from there. Perfect. Perfect. We'll put in the show notes. Yeah, we'll put in the show notes. Uh, I'll put in the comments too, where this is live in our Facebook group, and uh, and then you know, hopefully, hopefully, some people take you up on that offer. Maybe who knows? Maybe Ron and I will I find know. our. I, I may have heard you on this show called Hindsight Hanging. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Love to work with you guys. <laughs> yes. All right. Thanks, TJ. It's been a blast. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for being a fellow Denver resident. And uh, we will talk soon. Thanks. Easy. Cheers, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. <laughs> All Ooh. right, Ron. Looks like a roadmap <laughs> might be in our future. You okay. know, we could, we could actually meet TJ in person because 
another what? fellow. Do we, do we do those things anymore? I don't like, know. Some people meet in person, but uh, that was long ago. I don't meet you in person. <laughs> back before 2020. Well, you live you live next to Kansas, so no, I, don't, I don't go meet you on, on purpose because I don't want to drive that far. When we work together like in person, I saw you less than what I see you now. <laughs> yes. All right. So, uh, you know, everyone's waiting. What takeaways do we have today? I love a couple things, but I'm going to talk about you got to have the right mindset in order to be able to implement what TJ is going to do. And you have to check your ego at the door, right? So you hire... I mean, it's, it's crazy because people will hire experts and then tell the experts what to do and then make the experts conform to what they're doing that isn't working, right? Super frustrating. Like you hire the expert, let the expert be the expert to help you. So yeah. that's one. Um, the uh, gosh, These two, I have two other ones that are tied, but I'm going to, I'm going to go with, eh, eh. I'm going to go with this one. Look into the future. Understand where you want to go. Map it out backwards. Give yourself some breathing room, and then just work the plan that you've created. Yeah, right? that, I mean that's like that's kind of where I was going to go too. Like you've got to work backwards, right? TJ, you've you've got to see where you want to be. Uh, otherwise, you'll never get where you want to go. Uh, so, sure. but but one other piece too is the communication, right? Like you and I have talked about this before. Uh, we never talk. <laughs> Whether it be for your marriage, for your your kids, for uh, your employees, for your clients, whatever it is, like the communication standards that you set are the ones that will either make or break your business, your partnership, your relationship, or whatever, right? So definitely that communication is absolutely key. Uh, and so, uh, you know, before you start that relationship, ask yourself, right? Like, how, how do you want to, to be in that relationship on the communication side? Do you want to be the one that responds every two seconds, Mr. Ron Cool, or do you want to, uh, you know, actually make sure that uh, we're having a daily huddle, right? Because we didn't like the way the communication was at one point with something, right? So it's just, you've got to take a look and have that conversation. And, and it, it's, it's so important to, I believe 100% for any successful uh, business. Ah, one last thing, one last thing. And then we're leaving. Set the expectations with your clients, with everybody. <sighs> Set the expectations at the beginning. That was the other one that I was going to not say, but I thought it was super important. Too, too important. All right. So it was, I mean, Cause how many people don't set the expectations up front and then everyone's just frustrated in the relationship and you know, where frustration leads, they come work with Corey and Ron. <laughs> uh, all right so anybody that heard the takeaways but missed the rest of the show you're gonna go have to check yeah. it out uh soon because you don't want to miss all the wonderful things tj was saying today uh and uh you know yeah if you're if you're watching come on over thank you uh for watching it live in the facebook group and if you're listening why did you miss it and watch it don't watch it you got to come in the facebook group so facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash profits with all right, guys, have a good day. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you had as much fun as I did. And you know what? If you're not already a member of our Facebook group, what are you waiting for? Head on over to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash profits with. Guys, we are super excited to have you be a part of our community and help you get more visible, get more traffic, and get more sales. That's right, Ron. And every time someone is in our group, we get to share all the tips, the tricks, and everything that you can get profits with from your summits, your challenges, your workshops, your podcasts, your vodcasts, and so much more. Guys, thanks for being the best part of the Hindsight Hackers community.